As we come to the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews, we find ourselves in the middle of a of a warning from the Spirit of God. A warning to them, a warning to us. And chapter four is a continuation of that warning that began in chapter three. The Greek manuscript of this letter, as in all of the books of the Bible, does not have chapter divisions, doesn't have verse numbers. It only has the word of God that the Holy Spirit has given to us through men as he instructed them what to write down. And we have that word from God recorded here in the pages of the Bible. And this warning uh, that is given here in chapter 3 and chapter 4 is an urgent message that he has addressed to those to whom this letter was written. And it's an urgent message that has been given to us as well. It's a warning not to do what the children of Israel did while they were in the wilderness. Don't doubt God, he says. Don't push his word aside. Because there is nothing more wicked. There is nothing more evil. There is nothing more dangerous to our eternal soul than to harden our heart and to refuse to hear his word to us and to refuse to obey it. Because unbelief in his word, unbelief in the provision that he has made through his son will bring consequences that will last forever. Just like the children of Israel, he says, who wandered in the wilderness for 38 years and then they died and they never saw the promised land. So he tells us we're to learn something from them. We're to learn a critical lesson. A lesson that we need to learn so we don't repeat their sin. Unbelief brings death. Unbelief brings spiritual death. And it will result in eternal separation from God. That's a lesson that all of us need to learn. But the good news, he tells us, is that now, by faith, faith in Christ, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're told that in Romans 8, 1. So the question, perhaps the obvious question, is this. Are we in Christ Jesus? Well, many people claim to be. Many people think they are. But those who truly are in him, those who have trusted him as their Lord and Savior, will long to obey him. And when we fail to obey him, we are miserable. We weep. We mourn because of our sin. So the evidence of our faith will be seen in our lives. We will seek to live in reverence to him, not in carelessness. We'll want to build our life on him. We want to build our life on his word. We want to build our life on Christ as the foundation for our life. What did Jesus say in Matthew seven fourteen? He said that the gate is small, the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So the writer of Hebrews wonders if those to whom he was writing are on that narrow road. Are are they on that narrow road of obedience to Christ? Question we might want to ask ourselves. There's a way that leads to blessing. There's a way that leads to life. And there is a way that leads to death and to eternal suffering. Don't be like the Israelites in the wilderness who chose the wrong road. Therefore, the writer says in verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 4, let us 
who claim to know Christ. Let us who claim to belong to Him, yet who walk in a lifestyle of disobedience to Him, let us fear. Phobia. Let us be afraid. Terrified. Because we might be fooling ourselves. Don't fear those who kill the body, Jesus said in Matthew 10.28. They're unable to kill the soul. But rather, he said, fear the one who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Those who are wise will fear God. They'll reverence him. We're told that over and over again in the Psalms and in Proverbs. We're to be in awe of him, to reverence him, to worship him, to obey him. The writer of Hebrews says, wake up to this truth, lest we miss the opportunity that is still available to us. A promise, he says in verse 1, epangalia, something that has been proclaimed in his word, something good, a blessing, something, he says, that still remains, kataleo, which has been left behind for you. A promise of entering, he says, a my of being brought into his rest, into his karapasas, to his eternal home, of blessing, of peace, and of safety. Yes, he says, even if you have been disobedient to his word, even if you have been disobedient to your Lord, Confess your sin. Return to Him. Resolve that you will live for Him. He says, because the moment, the opportunity is still here. It is still here for you, for us. Don't ignore it. Don't push it aside. Don't harden your heart. And don't despair. Don't give up. Don't think that any one of you should seem to have come short of it, he says, who stare out. That's just too late. That you've missed out. That you've been left behind. It's not true. The grace of God is still available to you. But you should fear if you do not heed these words and return to him and continue to walk away from him. For indeed, he says, we have had these good, the good news preached to us. Euangelizo, salvation through the death of Christ has been proclaimed. He says, you've heard the message. We've heard the message. As it says in 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's the message for us. For all of us. Because we're told in Romans 3.23 that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we all need a Savior. We all need Christ. Just as they, he says in verse 2, that is the children of Israel, who also heard the message of their salvation, the good news that God offered to them a way of blessing. He offered them a way out of the wilderness. He promised to rescue them and to bring them into a place of rest and safety. But what stopped them? Did God stop them? What stopped them? The writer says in verse 2, the word of God that they heard, that they heard through Moses, did not profit them. Ophileo, it was of no benefit to them and no value for them. Why? He says, because 
even though they heard it, even though they understood it. He says it was not united by faith in those who heard it. Sun keranomi. It wasn't mixed together with true belief in God. Hearing the truth is not enough. Knowing the truth, that's not even enough. Believing it from our heart, trusting in it, trusting in Christ, that's the only way that we will be saved. The only way that we will be brought into the eternal rest of God, of Christ, the eternal rest of heaven. It's clear. The way to heaven is by faith in Christ and by nothing else. For we, he says, who have believed, we are sure to enter that rest. Rest for our heart. Rest for our soul. Rest Forever. Rest from our labor. From our suffering. Rest from our sin. We rest in the work of Christ. The issue is not how much we know. The issue is who we know. Whom we have believed. If we have put our faith in Christ, then by faith we will rest in his work for us because we're told in 1 Peter 5, 7, he cares for us. But we must believe because unbelief brings serious consequences just as the Spirit of God has proclaimed through David, the writer says here in verse 3, with these powerful words which he repeats to us. He says, God has said this as I swore in my wrath and my anger an oath, a promise, a promise that will not be shaken that they who do not believe shall not enter my rest in the work that I have finished for you. Although his works, the writer says, were finished from the foundation of the world. The work of creation, the work of salvation, God says, I have accomplished it all for you. You have no part in it. I have done it alone. For he has said somewhere, that is in Genesis 2-2, concerning the seventh day, and there we're told, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. He created a world, a perfect world, a world where we could live in harmony and in fellowship with each other and with our Creator. But since the day that Adam and Eve chose to trust in themselves, since they chose to trust in the lies of the enemy rather than in God, that rest that fellowship with God was broken. It's gone. And the only way that it can be restored is through Christ. That is why unbelief, unbelief in Christ is so self-defeating. Because unbelief cuts us off from the rest and the fellowship with God that he created us to enjoy. And so, again, in this passage, in Psalm 95, the writer says that God has told us that without faith, those who will not believe shall not enter my rest. He's making it clear to us, isn't it? We need faith in Christ in order to enter that eternal rest. There's no peace. There's no safety 
There's no blessing for those with an evil, unbelieving heart. But despite those who will not believe, the Spirit of God tells us here that the plan of God will continue. The promise remains, he says, for us. And since therefore it remains for some of us to enter it, to enter his rest, there is hope for us today. That is the message the Spirit of God gives us. There is hope for us. While those who formerly had good news preached to them failed, it says, ooh, in Greek, they were unable, they were unwilling to enter in to his rest. Why? It says here in verse 6, because of disobedience. Ape, thea. Because of their lack of faith. Because of their stubbornness. They just would not believe the word of God. So the Spirit says, don't follow that example. Don't shrink back in unbelief. Now is our time to believe God. Because he again fixes a certain day. Horizo, he has marked it out. He has established its boundary. He has determined that today is still Today, today is still the day of grace. Today is still the day of salvation. Saying through David in Psalm 95, after so long a time, when the writer of Hebrews quoted that that psalm a thousand years after David wrote it, just as has been said before by him, when David used the example of the Israelites to speak to his own generation. So now the Spirit speaks to us today, thousands of years later. He speaks to us through the, ver- the words in verse 7. And he says to us, today, Semeron, At this moment in time, if you hear his voice through his word, do not harden your hearts. Do not resist him as he speaks to you, to your heart. Because if we resist God, someday he will no longer speak to us. My spirit will not always strive with men, he said. In Genesis 6-3. And the day of grace will end. And the judgment of God will come. But today, this moment, salvation is available through Christ. Through Christ alone. Even though Joshua led another generation of the children of Israel into the promised land. But they never really experienced rest, did they? There was conflict. There was disobedience. There was rebellion. There was sin, and so there was discipline. There was chastening, and there was judgment that God brought down upon them because they failed to trust in Him. They failed to trust in his word. For if Joshua had given them rest, true rest, spiritual rest, then God would not have spoken of another day of rest after that, would he? The writer asks us that question. Of course he would. In Psalm 95, 500 years after Joshua lived, It says in verse 9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. A sabbatismos, an eternal rest. A Sabbath with no end. A rest for our soul. Blessing forever. When we are no longer, as it says in Deuteronomy 32.10, in this howling waste of this wilderness. 
We rest in Christ. We will rest in Him forever. That's true rest. For the one who has entered His rest, that is, the rest found in Christ, has Himself also rested from His works, from our works, from our labor from our efforts, as God did when he rested from his creation. We rest in him. We rest in Christ. So now we can have peace in the storms of life because we have peace with God. There's no fear of our past. No guilt of what lies behind us. There's no fear of the future. What lies before us? It says in Revelation 14, 13, we who know Christ will rest from our labors. This is a spiritual rest he's talking about, isn't it? Something he offers to us today, even in the midst of our turmoil and problems. So the writer of Hebrews says in verse 11, Let us therefore be diligent. Spudazzo. Move quickly. Don't delay. Do not delay to enter. That rest. Stop fighting with God. Stop working for a salvation that you can never attain by your own efforts. And rest in what he has provided for you in Christ. Labor to stop laboring. Lest any one of you fall, he says, pipto, fall down and never get up again. Through following the example of disobedience and unbelief as those in the wilderness. They didn't believe the word of God. It was given to them. They just didn't believe it. And so their bodies fell in the wilderness. So as he speaks to us, to you, we need to take his word seriously. This is God speaking to us today. For the word of God, he says, is living. Zao. It's, it's alive. It's not just words on a page in a book, but it speaks to us right where we are in our condition, in our situation, in our circumstances, and it has wisdom and insight that we can find Nowhere else, because this is the only book that comes from God. Can comfort us. Can make us uncomfortable. Can bring us to tears. Can bring us to our knees. It can cause us to see ourselves as if we are looking at ourselves in a mirror. It can cause us to see God as he speaks to us, directly to us through his word. And it not only can be an encouragement to us, it can be a source of terror because it exposes the truth concerning us. And sometimes that's a hard thing to take. It is active, the writer says in verse 12, and it guess it has energy, it has power, it is effective in reaching right down to the depths of our soul because it is sharper. Tomos, it's able to cut more deeply even than a two-edged sword, a bakaira, a dagger, with razor sharp edges on both sides that was wielded with precision and with with accuracy and effectiveness in hand-to-hand combat. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God just like that. 
with that kind of accuracy, with that kind of proficiency, the way a surgeon uses a scalpel. Piercing, he says. Diagneomai. Penetrating, cutting deep, down, as far as the division of soul, suke, exposing her heart, exposing her mind, her spirit, her numa, her life, her breath, piercing, dividing both joints and marrow. You can't go any deeper than that, can you? That's right down to the core of who we are. And the word is able to judge, he says, kritikos. It's able to discern, to evaluate. Even our thoughts, he says, our enthomesis, our true feelings, our doubts, our real desires, and our intentions are enoya, our true morality. What do we really believe? What really motivates us and comes from our heart? Showing us things that we may not even have known about ourselves. There's no creature, the Spirit says in verse 13. No ketesis, no created being on this earth that is hidden. Afanes, that is without Illumination before God. God sees all of us. There's nothing that is unseen in his sight from the sight of God. And opios, as we are standing there in his presence, that's what it says here, we stand in the very presence of God all the time. So nothing escapes his gaze. All things are open, we're told. Gumnos, naked, without covering. No disguises before him. He sees us the way we really are. Everything is laid bare, we're told. Trakelitso. It's clear. It's evident. It's a word that was used in a sporting event of wrestling. When a wrestler grabbed his opponent by the neck so that his opponent couldn't move and they stood there face to face, eye to eye. That's what happens with us and God. We stand face to face with him, with the very God of the universe. We can't run from him. We can't get away. We are fully visible to the eyes of him with whom we have to do, with the one to whom we will give an account. He knows us. He knows real faith. And he knows unbelief. And both will be revealed by him in the day of judgment. Remember that whatever we think is hidden is not hidden from him. So let us not be guilty of betraying Christ. How could it be that we would betray Christ? We might betray him even with a kiss with our words of love and devotion and commitment. Yet we trample on his blood by our lives, by our disobedience and our unbelief. And so we perish in the wilderness of our sin forever. May we bring glory to his name, not just by our words, but by our obedience to him. May we burn with a fervent desire to live a life of holiness separated unto him. May the love of Christ, his love for us, fill us and motivate us and direct us in all that we are and all that we do. Amen.
Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.